astronomy. I teach physics a lot. Um, and um, I'm currently the chair of the Trier College, commu communi uh, Trier College Community um, Committee. And, um, and uh, here we have several other hosts. So I will let all of you to introduce yourselves, uh, the hosts. Let's see. Okay, okay. I'll go. Uh, I'm Tom Herring. I'm a professor of physics at uh, Western Nevada College in Carson City. Uh, I'm also the director of the Jackson Davis Observatory, and I'm the, the vice chair under Glenda's amazing uh, leadership this, this uh, year. So prepare to be disappointed when I take over. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Chris Louie. I'm professor of physics at Montgomery College in Maryland. Um, I don't know what else uh, Say my background's in condensed matter long, long ago, but uh, my focus now is on teaching, creating inclusive inc environments for students. Tony? I'm just going to dive in. Tony Musumba from Bismarck, North Dakota. I teach at University of Mary. I'm an all-time TYC member. Thank you for having us. Andrew, Andrew Young. Hello, Andrew Young. Uh, I teach physics and astronomy at Casper College in Casper, Wyoming. I'm originally a Boston native, so Tom Brady, JFK, Conan O'Brien, but uh, transplanted myself out to Wyoming in uh, 2005. So thank you. Theo Gottis. Hi, Theodore Gottis here. I teach uh, at Oakton Community College. And for those of you who need a reference, that's about 10 minutes drive north from O'Hare Airport. Um, and I'm just happy to be here. They're my colleagues, this was a real lifeline for me this semester. Uh, my colleagues presented some great material and shared with us. And it's just nice to talk to people when they're, they're going through the same thing that you are and just have a little camaraderie. Reagan, could you introduce yourself? Reagan Gressley. I am an assistant professor at Harper College. I'm, what do you think, Theo, like 35 minutes out of O'Hare? <laughs> yeah, I would say you're just a little bit farther. I'm right by Theo's college. And these have been a real lifeline for me. And any ideas that I'm sharing today are definitely um, a combination of everybody here's work together. So uh, hopefully you can all see uh, the APT website um, displayed in your screen. And um, I would like uh, to highlight the, um, this community that, um, uh, that we uh, have been developing and we've been doing um, weekly Zoom meetings to share our experiences. Uh, so the way to get to uh, the repository of uh, all the resources we've been collecting is if you are on the APT website, you go to About. And on the About, you can go to APT Committees. And once you are here in APT Committees, we are the two-year college committee. So you click here, two-year college committee. And here is our Google site that is maintained by me, but is hosted really by uh, APT. So you get to this link here. And uh, we have an email list, uh, our email list to join um, uh, basically the invitation for our Zoom meetings and et cetera, all go through our email list. So to, to join, you send an email to join, cptac uh, shell, et cetera. That's as simple as that. So we would like to talk to you about uh, the resources we've been collecting. Uh, so um, by around uh, March 20th, we started to do this weekly uh, Zoom meetings. We did seven, we are about uh, at, uh, in our eighth week of these weekly Zoom meetings. And um, so basically, um, by the time uh, that our college, my college here in, in Long Island, New York, told us, uh, we, you don't have access not even to lab equipment anymore. Uh, clearly to me, the biggest challenge to me was uh, labs and how could I make the labs more interactive because I figured lecture and etc. There, there were ways in my mind that I could make an experience still similar <laughs> in some senses to what we had in class, but with labs would be so hard. And, and I was really in doubt, uh, questioning why, why as a nation, 
we don't have a common repository, I, I thought like that initially, uh, of a lot of, say, videos, interactive videos or things, because there's some classical experiments we could all have together. Where to find all this? So anyway, we started those weekly meetings and um, we've been collecting a lot of information together. But so when you click on resources here, um, you have some, first of all, just some general resources that as a TYC community we find useful. And there is the usual stuff that probably all of you know by now, such as Fizport, uh, Compadre, Perbytes, Pickup, Physics for Life Science, Top L. Uh, but then we have a few other links, for instance, for practical demonstrations, for video analysis, uh, simulations for labs and demonstrations. Uh, so these are more uh, simulations, right? Um, um, so, um, astronomy too, we have collecting uh, some of the links. Um, so these are some uh, standalone links that we saw. These are very, very, very uh, uh, popular links. But here is the link to uh, uh, our resources shared exclusively during, well, the, the Zoom meetings. So you would click over here. Uh, about our Zoom meetings. So it brings me to this page over here. And this page is where we've been sharing labs. So many of us have uh, recorded labs with whatever equipment we still have left, had left. And so as you click here, shared labs, you see uh, many of us have uh, had some uh, lab information. For instance, I will click on uh, the one I, uh, had uh, prepared here a while ago. There is a video about RC circuits and the students go through the video and hopefully can make a measurement and time and the uh, charging and their, their instructions too, etc. cetera. Um, so, so basically what you find there is many of us have been uh, sharing uh, labs like this. Um, and uh, we can go more over this later some remote uh, re teaching tools. So um, this is all, they are all short lists because as I say, uh, many, uh, as we, the disclaimer here, um, there, are, there are other uh, organizations that are doing the fantastic job of keeping all these advices, resources, much better than we do. We do what we have been finding as a community that's popular to us. So if you click on this link here, you have this fantastic article by uh, Fizport on suddenly I have to move, move to face-to-face -face astronomy, physics, online course, what should I do? This is an enormous and long, long, long link with amazing resources. And I would say everybody should take a look at this. It's amazing. It was done by Fizport. So we don't have the intention of doing anything like that because we can't, but, um, but, We've been doing, we've, as a community, we've been finding what are the, the, the biggest um, challenges um, that we want to, to explore more. So here's a list of what's coming up for our future meetings and discussions. But we started, so in March 20th, and we didn't have a topic for the meetings. However, we, uh, we were just trying to understand what people wanted or not, and towards the end, we did a survey and we surveyed uh, people such as, how do you plan on teaching lecture courses? Um, how do you, um, have you, have you existing labs, uh, hands-on lab that can be taught remotely? If people already had those labs, if they wanted to share, how can being in touch with the, this group help you? And so we had this first surveys to figure out how people are doing and where could we go with this type of meetings and how they could be useful. Mark, if you are there, do you mind sending the poll now, the first three questions so that our participants can tell us where they are and uh, uh, who they are, a little bit about who they are right now. So we have three polling questions for you. If you could please answer and, and participate and answer them. The first question is what physics classes have you been teaching this semester? So if you can please answer that. The second question, there are three together. 
have you taught a physics course online pr prior to the coronavirus crisis? And how do you feel about your institutional support? Did they give you enough pedagogical, technological, etc., assets support? Uh, so if you can please uh, participate and answer those, that would be awesome. Well, I'm going to give my answers. Um, <clears throat> so as you were answering, and uh, Mark, whenever you think you have uh, enough people answered, if you want to share the results, go ahead. And in, anytime you, you, you think you reach close to the 38 participants. Yeah, we're up to 33. Wow, that looks good. That, that sounds good already. All right, last chance. Okay. I do not teach this is spring, but yes. So um, always, um, so there's always a space for the different cases for you to, to, to type information on the chat, right? So a lot of people are teaching the, the, the here, currently here in this chat, in this room, uh, calculus physics one, one and two, right? So mechanics and maybe electromagnetism. And um, yeah, algebra-based physics is also a large group. Um, most of us have not taught online, 70%. And how do you feel? Most of us feel we got enough support from the beginning, average support. Yeah. Uh, as we discover more tools, we will discover that maybe we needed more. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you for your participation. So, um, so as we, um, on March 20, so we had, um, so we had, a, after the, our survey, we still had one more meeting, say, without a focused team. We were still very worried about labs and how to do more interactions with labs. Andrew Young participated a lot and he gave, the, gave us a lot of links. For instance, this is his link, I'm going to click here, hands-on lab of physics one. I'm gonna click, these are some of the resources available from him. And for instance, he has here a video of an experiment and he has the setup. And these are very simple, very simple uh, experiments that students could do at home. Uh, they still need a few tools, but these are great ideas. And uh, so we were very worried, I think at the beginning in our first meetings and trying to focus on hands-on labs and, 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 and indeed this is still something we think about. Andrew, do you have anything to that you, you can you, you would like to add about this? Well just is sort of the evolution of uh, physics at Casper College. We've been teaching physics online at Casper College for about 10 years now and originally when we were teaching the labs, um, the general physics one, general physics two courses, the general physics one course, their online labs was basically um, I would do the live lab that we usually do, normally do for a physics class and record it as videos and take pictures of it, like recording a marble falling or, you know, a picture of a, of a ruler or, or, or scale. And the students would analyze that uh, content as part of the labs and answer questions. So there's a projectile launcher there, you know, it operated and, you know, show how this works and stuff. So that was done for converted live labs. Uh, for mechanics, uh, force, energy, and stuff. For physics two, I used a lot of FET simulations, and I snuck in some University of Nebraska labs, which are astronomy labs, but they're really good also physics applications. And I used those simulations for our physics two curriculum for electricity, magnetism, and thermodynamics. Then I sort of got some pushback from the community that they wanted labs that were more tactile, where you had some tangible assets and you could actually move around physically some things and and such, so I moved from converted live labs and simulations to hands-on labs, which is a company that makes uh, boxed kits, and e-science labs, which also makes boxed kits where students buy a box of content, form the labs at home, and submit photos, graphs on Excel, and their data on Excel, and uh, they would upload it and I would review them. And so that seemed to assuage a lot of concerns and fears um, regarding how labs operate online. Although these days, now we take a look at uh, uh, Virtual Labs is a company that makes virtual simulations. 
uh, Labster also makes uh, virtual simulations. And so um, Pivot Interactives, I don't know if you heard of that company, but they make digital labs where they record videos and they have their own products and suite of physics labs. So, you know, that idea that I had 10 years ago is now like a multi-million dollar company. So I think I missed out on the business opportunity there, but uh, we've seen it come full circle where virtual labs are now more accepted and digitized live labs are still are now accepted in the community. So, so that is sort of the short terse distillation of our labs on our end. So thank you. I would say that uh, what we have here typed is just a summary and there's much more was uh, talked about during the meetings and there's recording of the meetings uh, over here. They lasted an hour and sometimes even the chat text is here. Um, so uh, by the, thank you so much, Andrew, and jump in at any time, anybody jump in at any time. Uh, third, we decided we needed to focus, uh, the community was talking more about worries about tests, how to share, how to create them, sign, assign, deploy, etc. So Greg Mulder, our colleague from Oregon, was uh, showing to us great scope. And great scope was is is just a way. So he was uh, during this meeting. You it's just can begin one, to use one uh, software where you can. It's it's free up to a certain point, and uh, the students will uh, upload say the PDFs, but they will highlight this is question the zone the general region in the PDF where there's question one, general region where there's question two. Because normally when we grade tests and things, we, we want to go grade only question one for everyone, only question two for everyone. So, so this, this, this grade scope allows you to, to do that more easily. So it's nice to know what people are using. I don't know if Greg is here present in this meeting, if Greg wants to say something. Um, but... Um, so we, uh, so we, we discussed many things, but I remember this was academic integrity and tests and cheating. That was a big deal. And uh, Kareen, I think, was talking. Kareen is 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 not here today, but he was talking about how he implements his tests using the video, the lock, uh, a lockdown browser, um, and and video cameras and etc. Even so. The, and random questions and um, formulas in the questions and etc. And even so, it is hard to block cheating fully. And so we were starting to think about the a way that we need to maybe modify and, and assess the students differently and not just the normal standard assessment that we had before. So we, we will have a meeting about that uh, later on and uh, Chris and, and Reagan can talk about it uh, when we get there. After that, on April 10, we talked about labs and, and, and again, and Kendra was, uh, I think there were some uh, chat information where people were highlighting, to, even to Andrew, Andrew, there's, there are apps on in your phone that you can use instead, for instance, of the tuning fork and et cetera. And indeed, uh, we had a meeting uh, here at Kendra's slides, PowerPoint slides, et cetera, on, uh, on how she uses uh, the on how she, she uses essentially apps uh, to make most of her labs. So, um, so uh, um, cell phone apps for, for the lab. So this was very nice and uh, we brainstormed about lots of that. Kendra also has a nice um, link to, um, uh, to her, um, she has a blog on uh, lots of nice uh, apps of physics using mobile phones, right? So this is her a link to her uh, uh, blog and she has one for astronomy too. And more, I think Beth was sent an email through APT highlighting the uh, smartphone physics on the, on the rise, right? So this was a, 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 a link to that uh, um, um, information. Um, that Beth Cunningham just sent. I don't know if Kendra is uh, present in the meeting, if she would like to say anything, but the, uh, we discussed many different things over here and uh, we were exploring physics with smartphones and simple tools that the students can do at home and do more interactive labs where students can collect the data at home. By April 17, we were back again talking about tests and how to think outside the box, alternative ways to evaluate student learning. 
So instead of having this uh, formative assessments, how to have, um, oh boy, what is it? How to have assessments where uh, we're focusing on what the students know and exploring more what they know and to strengthen their knowledge. And so this is where, for instance, um, uh, Reagan shared her ideas, fantastic one, uh, assessment reboot on how to do a, a test, and Reagan can go through this, can, can speak more to, to you, but how to do a test where the students will now pick a scenario and solve for everything in their scenario. So it's, a, it's an assessment that's almost like a project. So, so, so she has uh, measurements and a rubric of measurements that they can do, and they'll get points for that. So all that you can measure about your, you choose a topic, so it can be about a cylinder rolling down a ramp, a boat floating on a container of water, ballistic pendulum, and so for everything you can in that scenario. So if you find, if you measure distance, time, height, da -da -da -da, and then out of that, you can get forces and etc. She has a scorecards. This was very nice. And at the time, she was starting to apply this type of this type of test. Here is her padlet of lots of ideas that the students could pick up to to get inspired and start their project, and then so for everything based on these projects. Reagan, do you want to say something about this? How did this go? So, Glenda, oh my gosh, you were paying attention. <laughs> So everything she said is totally right. I have it. Um, I follow Bloom's, Bloom's taxonomy when I built it. So there's measurements, um, calculations, and then using your physics skills. So thanks <laughs> um, to do it. And my students are turning them in today and tomorrow. And I have to say, I couldn't be more proud of them. I zoomed with a student today and she said, wow, um, all of these things all these topics like force diagrams and energy conservation, I was like, yeah, 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 you know, paper, pencil, I can do it. But now I'm doing it with real stuff in my house and I get it. And she's going to be uh, like a house designer. She got into the Art Institute of Chicago's design program in the fall. And, and so it was, it's like, so she's not gonna use physics totally all the time, but it's very cool. Uh, it's working very well. Um, so I'll have more results after it's due tomorrow. So this is a great way to avoid cheating as well, because the works are so original. Um, and that's what uh, our, um, our conversation was very uh, centered over here. Chris also had ideas about alternative assessments. Chris, Louie, are you there? Yep, I'm here. <laughs> so one of the things um, I've been trying in terms of alternative assessments is having my students create their own problems within specific criteria and then providing solutions. So um, I talked a bit about that um, in the student created problems. They've actually been fairly well done. Um, if I were to repeat this, I think I'd need to specify different criteria a bit, but again, it's hard to cheat when uh, you need to come up with your own problems. Um, I just finished the asynchronous test um, where I had a whole bunch of questions and students had to upload their solutions and then review someone else's solutions. Um, they had a, about a week to do that. Um, so what, what you're seeing right now is uh, the, an example from a student who's being very creative in his storytelling. Uh, we have a, a question from Jen. Oh, yes. Did you have any students who um, miraculously invented the same question? Absolutely not. Um, I was really impressed with how creative they have been. They do get credit for some creativity, um, but a lot of them are bringing in, you know, the current situation. So early on, there were an awful lot of problems about toilet paper and <laughs> hand sanitizers. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, so um, so the, the, in the recording of the meeting, you went in the chat box, you can hear more about it. And uh, there were more discussions beyond. Oh, I wanted to highlight this. Toby Dietrich also came all, so many times to all of our meetings. I don't know if he's here, 
But Toby always had fantastic uh, collaborations and Toby has a YouTube channel. This is separate, it's not about tests about drop tower physics, and I would really invite you to watch this. This is to teach about uh, gravity and just to um, uh, um, break the, some misconceptions from your students, what would happen with, uh, with and without gravity. And uh, so these are very cool videos, et cetera, and he has a wonderful resource over here. Um, so uh, that also, so normally we would talk about a topic and eventually towards the end, there would be different ideas and more things to share. By uh, April 24th, we had a whole meeting on astronomy. And um, uh, we had our host was Thomas Herring. Thomas Herring, he's gonna tell you a bit more about the observatory over here and the photos he has, the, the, the amazing, images he has and he already told us that if we need more images of anything that we need the, the observatory is available and he has a large group of people that can take more of these pictures etc for us but um i'll let thomas uh, tell you a bit more about this very soon i just want to ooh, how do i go back to that i don't know <laughs> got stuck into something okay uh, also, uh, Geoffrey, uh, Geoff Matthews was given, uh, was telling us about simulations, astro sims, and uh, it was pretty amazing. For instance, there's some here about dark matter density and stellar orbital speeds. I'm just going to click on this, uh, and this is a simulation of dark matter, and you can change the density uh, of dark matter and the positioning, and so that curve is going to change as well, etc. So he has several others, I'm just playing one of them, and these are publicly available. One thing I wanted to mention, and I had a slide over here, but I, sh I forgot to, to, to tell you about, in principle, we are assuming that everything we are sharing is under uh, this attribution of non-commercial, share-alike, international, uh, creative commons. So um, in principle, we are saying that our material we have online there is, is, has this, this, this approach, okay? This is the license for, for all of us, Creative Commons. And um, yes, so um, Tom, would you like to say something about the astronomy meeting? Uh, sure, I, there, there were a, a, there's a lot of, of good information there. Um, during that meeting, Jeff had a lot of, of already collected things about simulations to use and some, some ideas about how to use them well. Um, uh, Toby also talked about uh, some potential future work, is past and future work uh, with the Eddington experiment during eclipses. Uh, if you're interested in taking part in 2024, uh, uh, find, find Toby. Uh, and and send him an email. Uh, he's got some some great stuff. This is this is some of the data they gathered in 2017 uh, about about the 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 you know location of the stars. Really a recreation, and they're they're getting uh, results that are competitive with with really big telescopes with essentially amateur grade telescopes and and some creativity and, and a few CCD cameras. Um, Andrew Young had a, a lot of great stuff. You can see all the all those links there. Um, some ideas about how to deliver things online and remotely. Uh, my focus was really that I have this group of essentially uh, mostly retired people that that I can tell you are very very bored in in the Nevada lockdown. They want stuff to do. So if if you've got uh, if you've got objects that you'd like to get images of, let me know. I've, I've got a, a volunteer right now who's uh, going through uh, collections of odd looking galaxies just, just to find things. And I've been doing some myself, not as much since uh, the semester ends for us this week, so I've been grading everything. Um, and hopefully my skies will clear. It's been really windy at night, uh, which just makes imaging practically impossible but anyway send me uh, send me email my emails right up there at the at, on, on this on this page uh, thomas.herring at wnc.edu I'm happy to, to capture images of things for you um, and, and uh, both both images suitable for just 
nice looking at stuff and and for uh, some CCD images that are good for for analyzing things, um, and all of the images that are in that in that provided link, the imagery from the Jackson Davis Observatory, those are free to use. Um, just put a little from the JCDO note somewhere, and we'll be happy with it. That's, that's part of our mission to to provide those things to whomever wants them. So it's all publicly accessible stuff. Don't worry about. Uh, using it when and wherever and however you want to. Awesome. Uh, then uh, on May 1st, we had a meeting on what are your teaching plans for the summer? So many of us were finally uh, ending our fall classes. I haven't yet, but uh, some of us were. And then already planning for more, um, more long range plans, new equipments or, uh, that we would need for the summer. Many of us are teaching asynchronous classes in the summer, fully online in the summer. So they, it required a different preparation than, than what we just had finishing the fall, the spring semester, right? So it was a meeting about that. And, um, yeah, the, uh, uh, we talked about uh, different things we can buy, equipment, et cetera. Uh, our most recent meeting was about showcasing tools, tools to deliver material remotely. Mike, Mike, Michael Boutros was uh, uh, guiding that meeting for us. And um, at the time of this meeting, we also had one of our colleagues, um, um, Dean Tucker, who was highlighting uh, um, a, a book he has available online for free, and uh, which is um, conceptual physics, algebra-based physics. And, uh, and as we were going through this, uh, we also looked at some of these videos, their videos, their exercise, etc. And this is some of the videos inside the book. And we were paying attention how they used uh, this, the, this, this tool called PlayPosit. And in this tool, it's paralyzed now because I have to answer this quiz until I can move on with the video. So we were all like, how can I do this? We wanna do this. We wanna have our PowerPoint presentations and we want to have interactive, say, quizzes where the student cannot move forward until it answers that. So we're sure they, they, they saw the video, et cetera, and then we can go on. So we're all learning about tools. And um, so this is all available. Um, it's all available here in specifically the tools that is, is, is right here. That one is called, it's, it's, it's free up to a certain point as well. They all have restrictions. If you use it too much, eventually you have to pay display posit. But there's so many other tools we've been talking about, Screencast-O-Matic. Uh, up to 15 minutes is free, and you can have your video, your face, and the slides, and uh, etc. So we are all learning also from each other in these tools, uh, remote clickers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So some of the tools are mentioned here. Some already went to this remote teaching tools link we have here, as uh, as we found that that makes all. Um, we were talking about rubrics for labs as well. Uh, that may become a, a bigger meeting in the future <laughs> about rubrics in general. Uh, this was all rubrics that we are sharing about labs. Uh, and uh, yeah, we will have a meeting on this coming Friday on wrapping up spring 2020, what worked and what didn't. We will have a meeting on May 22nd on sharing positive learning experiences with the students. Uh, and then hopefully something to talk about the future APT virtual meeting. But um, this is the general, uh, the general tour of the resources we've been collecting so far. Uh, so we will we open the forum for discussions, questions from everyone. I was just using, I was curious if anyone is using coding uh, in computer science enriched activities uh, to help do distance learning. So Chris, anyone besides me? Chris or, no, we, we haven't had a meeting on that, um, but Chris Orban just, he, he's going to have a very nice uh, workshop and, and also 
um, Pickup has a nice workshop coming to a uh, workshop of a conference, right? Pickup is going to have also a conference. So there, there are other amazing events coming up. Uh, um, can, I, can I ask Mark to comment on the, the workshop update? Because those are still up in the air. Yes. So the, um, the workshops for the summer meeting, you mean? Yes. Yeah, so we're in the process of, of trying to figure out what is the best way to organize the workshops. And in particular, trying to really think about if the meeting is online, uh, do we have to stick to kind of the, the typical structure of a meeting where the workshops were before the meeting uh, uh, for a specific time block and then the, the rest of the sessions occurred afterwards. And we're trying to balance the idea of um, kind of rethinking the structure because of the, the benefits of online verse in person, uh, as well as the structure of what would happen if we had some sessions that were pre-recorded and kind of on demand versus some workshops or plenary talks that were live and kind of in person at, at, at specific times. So um, we have a great kind of task force that's working together to figure out all these questions. And I hope that we will have some good answers for everyone soon. Mark, would you like Which is a great way of not answering your question, Chris. <laughs> Mark, we have a couple more uh, uh, um, poll questions. We do. Uh, would you like to go to the second set? Yes, please. Um, so here we have a, a few questions. Perhaps we could have asked that before. But what learning management system are you currently used if you're using any? So if you're using none, you just say none. There are two questions here for you to answer. If you scroll down, there's another one saying, are you using an electronic assessment system from any of the following? So we would like to know if you are, if you are creating your own, not using any of these, if you're using another that's not listed here, please type on the chat box. So my answer is Blackboard, and I am using, expert from, for homework, yeah. Google Classroom is not a learning management system. It's a barely adequate content delivery system. It does not do learner management as well as, as it thinks it does. All right, last chance. Here are some results. Thank you, Mark. So um, Canvas, Blackboard, um, yeah, Canvas and Blackboard, most of us, but there is quite a bit of Moodle and Google Classroom and other. I'll have to go through the list here to read about the other. Uh, are you using an electronic assessment system? We see a lot of Pearson and using other tools such as uh, the learning management systems to, to put in tasks and other. So we got to keep none, uh, many of us, so none here is record. So many of us are not using any kind of form of electronic assessment uh, at this point. But perhaps uh, this will, will change as we have more and more of this online methods of teaching classes. I wonder, perhaps this will have to change. How do you feel students in general are coping with the greater independent demands on studying remotely? So Mark, if you don't mind, can you send the last remaining final three poll questions? Absolutely. So uh, someone asked something that we want you to answer. <laughs> <laughs> which is how do you feel that you perform during the transition to online remote teaching? Uh, 
How do you feel your students perform during the transition to online teaching? And there's a final one. In your view, what is the biggest challenge of teaching physics remotely? There are several options here, and hopefully this will open my, up the discussion even more. So if you can please answer this, I tell you for me, this is my answer. And you can choose as many options as you want in the last one. I'll say this. I also used Trinket in, in the past, not this semester, but I did use Trinket. So a future, a future meeting we'll, we will do eventually is more about uh, coding and integrating coding in our classes. This is in um, forever a discussion. Uh, uh, but we've been focusing more on how to, to, to do online teaching in general so far. Biggest challenge, just-in-time teaching methods don't work for asynchronous classes. I choose average for my students, but some have done really well and many have done terribly. All right, I'll keep the poll open for another five seconds. Is Poology more like social media than learning platform? Okay. How do you feel you performed? We are going to say the similar answer I had. We, we performed average, most of us, and many of you are thinking you did great under the circumstances. That's great, I believe so. Uh, we've been working a lot harder in general. How do you feel your students did? Also, between average and good. The, in your view, what is uh, the, or are the biggest challenges? Maintaining participation and engagement. So this is what something we discussed, uh, we, this question came up a lot in our, in our meetings, is whether, how many students have dropped since we ch changed to online classes, right? And we, we, in some classes, a lot have dropped. In some of us, what we found is that they just, it's not really that they have dropped, as Chris have said, they just, uh, they just disconnected and, and we can't reach them anymore. It's not even dropping, they just went blank. Um, Glenda, there, yeah. there's more than just the students actually dropping the class. It's when I went to synchronous class sessions, it looked a lot like lecturing and I absolutely hated that. You know, what happened to the whiteboard meetings and the discourse management that was a, such an integral part and, my, and the, I just got the student evaluations and that, that's what they said is they missed all that interaction in class, even though they didn't give up on me, you know, so it, it's more than just um, dropping the class. It's, in, you know, they stuck it out, but they didn't have the engagement that they had previously. And I want to figure out how to do something differently if, you know, if I have to teach that way in the fall, you know, online in the fall. Is Dwayne Desbian here in this meeting? Dwayne, are you here? Dwayne, no? Uh, Tony Musumba, you watched one of the Dwayne's class where he broke the students into, Dwayne is the master of discourse management, right? We, we would say, uh, we went through. I can speak a little to that. I mean, I, I never really was able to get into using uh, breakout rooms because I was too busy surviving, uh, trying to get uh, my synchronous and asynchronous stuff taken care of. I just didn't have any time to have any bells and whistles, although in actual sense, breakout rooms are pretty easy. But I also had a few students. I had like 10 students and, and something like that. But I saw Dwayne doing really a good job. Uh, he was, he allowed me to visit his classroom and uh, he was doing discourse management using uh, the whiteboard function in 
in Zoom and he, he broke out his students into groups of two of, or groups of three or four and they would work on a problem like a ranking task problem. Uh, this was an ENM problem where they were looking at electromagnetic induction and it was a pretty hefty problem and the engagement was great. So I think, uh, and I've had Chandra talk about whiteboards, uh, uh, breakout rooms here too. It's, it's really something that people should consider using on Zoom. They seem to have a lot of promise for how you can engage students. But obviously, the one big thing was that these students were already doing this stuff, so it's a lot easier. If you're starting off, you may have to do a lot more than just uh, get them into groups. You have to do all the, the hard work of, of priming the pump and all that. Yeah, I would agree. Thanks. I would say that my, my class that I had, I had one class where I had them for a semester previously was a physics two, and I really had an easy time sort of keeping them engaged. I, I didn't have the option of doing the group thing, uh, but my other class, they were just totally, you know, I only had them for like six weeks and trying to do any kind of group activities online. They were just, without that priming that you said in person, I don't know how you would do that. I would love to have one of these two IC meetings uh, all about discourse management or engagement or breakout rooms or whatever you want to call it. You know, how do we do the things that we believe in now that we're all online? And, or, you know, like I, there's a, this week it feels like we're, we have to justify, in fact, there's a, an email probably telling us that we need to plan on online. I'm, I, you know, we haven't announced that yet, but so I, I want to plan that more intentionally. And I think that this, this group of people have, are such an incredible resource that um, it will work a lot better if I, if I learn from all of you. I was, I was what? Oh, in here, if that's okay. <laughs> um, just addressing how do you prime the pump? Um, and I think this goes back to, you know, to finding an icebreaker that works from the beginning. Um, one of the things I, I've been thinking about because we are going to online in the fall, um, or at least starting it, is to go back to an idea I stole from somewhere about having the students decide on the syllabus. So the, the grade breakdown. Um, this was something I used to do, but it took a lot of time. And so I stopped doing it, but it really helped break the ice. I would put students into small groups. They had to decide on how they were going to split up various different grading things, quizzes and tests and participation or whatever. And then we would come together as a class. Um, and I think this would be a great first day remote learning activity if you could do it synchronously um, so that students could all have to, I mean, they, they're invested in their grades, right? So this is something they will participate in because they, they have an investment. So anyways, that was my two cents. So we definitely need to have a meeting on how to promote more uh, discourse management and how to promote more student engagement and active student engagement during these remote lectures, uh, recitations. Uh, and hopefully Duane can come to one of those and help us also to share his experience. Um, I was thinking that the high school folks can also help out. It's basically the modeling approach to, to teaching. So those modelers would definitely be helpful in, in, in helping us do this kind of stuff. Um. There's been some comments um, on the use of Jamboard for all the um, kind of whiteboarding aspects of, of modeling. Uh, does someone want to comment on the use of Jamboard? Uh, I guess I can. Can, can you hear me? <laughs> okay, so I'm a high school teacher. So I have a small class, just um, 11 in my APC, Physics C. And um, we ha I had flipped my class, and so then we went to online uh, learning. I wanted to keep the flip. So during class, what I did is separate them into the, um, you know, small groups. 
And the Jamboard is just, I think it's a Google thing. So everyone easily can get on it. And I could prepare um, separate Jamboard for each person. And if you have an iPad, it's really good because you can you know, write with your pencil. And so I would put, post the question on the Jamboard and, I, and they could all together at the same time. And so it was as if they were at their, what we did in class, which is they'd all go to the whiteboards. Uh-oh, um, I'm getting a sign that my internet is unstable. Okay, they would go to the whiteboards and draw, write, and then I would wander around facilitating. And so basically we did that with Zoom and the Jamboards, because each group would have their own Jamboard and they would all write on it. And I could easily, with Zoom, go visit the breakout rooms. You know, you just press join breakout room and no one's muted, so we could all just talk normally. And it was, I thought it was pretty awesome and they really liked it. I so hope you has hear that. So there's also been some comments about how to do this kind of asynchronously. And has anyone found success with students working asynchronously with other students using a whiteboard or getting at that discourse that we all want our students to have? Some of my students have just jumped into making their own um, Google Meet and collaborating um, almost to the point of or sometimes to the point of of literally copying each other but they're you know at least they're talking to each other i guess yeah. oh a private discord server for talking that's interesting in the in the chat mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't know what's happening when it's uh, private uh, chat rooms and etc. Um, yeah, that gets more complicated. But the coding, uh, coding aspect, coding can be can be this this projects where students need to collaborate to work together and then submit. So I can see how uh, we can use, for instance, coding on promoting more discussions and more collaboration as well. Um, Canvas. Canvas seems to be it's so. Uh, Canvas seems to have a lot of bells and whistles that uh, Blackboard that I use does not have as much. And uh, so we had a colleague showing all everything on Canvas and all the different ways of accessing uh, questions and etc. That we we don't have with Blackboard or doesn't seem to be as accessible. Um, About instructors that help to make the student transition to online easier, any more information about what those instructors did? I'll try to answer that in, you know, in briefly. For those instructors that made the transitions easier for the students, um, they, there's two separate thoughts. The first thought is, and I only say this from part of my experience, before I started teaching online, I taught live physics for you know, you know, six, eight years or so. So teaching the online physics class was based on best practices I learned in the live world. And then, you know, what I did in the live world, I tried to emulate in the online world as well. And so as I've been teaching more online physics classes, the lessons I learned there, I brought back to the live world. So I saw sort of a convergence of how I teach the live class and how I taught the online class. So they are one person teaching, taking either class, will not really see any difference. So for those instructors who had taught successfully um, making that transition to the online world. They already used a lot of stuff from and tools and pedagogy from the live world and just did some little tweaking so that it still worked in the online world. The other um, process is that they allowed for more extra credits, more time, extended timelines, additional content, um, more communication through Zoom and stuff to help alleviate the lack of personal communication, but to also give students great flexibility in doing additional content or different content to help supplement their grades. So these are the things that I heard from the grapevine that allowed them to be a little more successful. May I ask a follow-up question? So uh, Andrew, that second part was great about those extra 
things, extra credit, extra time, extra Zoom communication, but the practices that worked in the real face-to-face -face classroom that transitioned well to online classroom, it's like I, I'm still seeing a gap. I'm not a big experienced teacher. I don't know what it is that would work. Can we get more information about that? Yeah, so part of the um, piece for the live world is that, you know, I used um, whiteboards a lot and then transitioned quickly to PowerPoints. And so all my lectures were on PowerPoints and on PDF files for the, for the live class. But these are always made available for students to download later in the learning management system on Moodle. And so for an online class, I basically have the same thing with my PowerPoints and stuff. But in addition to that, in the online world, I started creating audio and video podcasts of my lectures. So, and they had audio and video um, content, plus my PDFs, plus my transcripts of everything I said. And that was what I had developed in the online world, which I then ported back to my live world. So if students missed a class and stuff, well, that's okay. You know, you still have my audio and video, visual recordings as well. So the content um, transferred easily from both a live version and the online version. In terms of assessments, I used the Mastering Physics electronic assessment system. And so in, <clears throat> in the classic, classic grading in the live world, I had done you know, paper assignments, paper homework and stuff. In the online world, I used Mastering Physics. But then I, in the online world from using Mastering Physics, I brought that back to the live world. So now I use Mastering Physics in both the live and the online world. So it's always a sort of cross-pollination of what I did in the live world I can do in online, but then what I learned from online is good, I use in live as well. And so they, again, follow parallel tracks so that a student can take either versions of it and not notice like any major differences and such. So I hope that answers your question a bit. Uh, yeah, that's great. If I have more questions, can I contact you? Yes, yeah, so I'll put my email address in the, in the chat box. So absolutely. Thank you, Andrew. That's very helpful. Can I add something? So I just, I, I didn't really feel that my transition to online was really that great. Um, but one of the things I noticed when I, uh, I was lecturing is that I had these uh, five or four students who were on video and the rest weren't on video. And I felt like I couldn't lecture the way I, I used to lecture because it kind of seemed like there was more personal connection. And I found that I slowed down considerably and almost thought maybe even in my live classes, I usually go too fast. Uh, that was one of the things I, I noticed and I spent a lot of time kind of going over stuff because these guys had a lot of other classes. And one of the things that I kept coming back to was one student was always very thankful that I was going slow because they were, they were getting dumped on a lot of work in other classes. The other thing that I started thinking about is, well, I can't translate this live class into an online class one-on-one, -on -one, or I can't even do a, a really great job. Maybe I can do a bad job, uh, but not harm anyone, you know? So what I discovered is that there was one homework uh, or something that I gave them in class that translated well, and that was a free write. They would read the and then write a summary or just write freely about what they were reading. I found that that could still work out. Uh, and so that I used that and that was one of the assignments I kept. I, I gave up the journal and uh, I had only one homework assignment, uh, online homework assignment uh, for, for, for the entire time. But obviously we finished earlier than you guys. Uh, so that's why by April 21st, we were pretty much, 22nd, we were pretty much done. But those were some of the things I saw that were different for me. But obviously, as I was saying, I couldn't really move on to an online teaching environment because it re re really requires a lot more than just this remote learning that we were doing. Uh, and that was a good thing for me to be aware that I wasn't going to replicate whatever is a good online class. Well, we are coming to the end of our hour that was scheduled, and um, I'd like to thank everyone for participating and, and continuing 
this um, this tradition that we have here of Tuesday night conversations. Uh, I think we've had a, a consistent, great conversation every week of people showing up and, and really sharing their their opinions, their experiences, their resources. Uh, and I think it's really showing what um, the AAPT community is about. So um, thank you uh, for everyone, and I, I appreciate it. We, there's been a lot of great resources shared in the chat. And um, as a reminder, we will be uh, condensing that chat and, and pulling in all the um, resources out and then making that available to people, as well as the, the video of this that we will post on our YouTube site. So I'd also like to thank our hosts uh, and really the, the very strong showing from our, our two-year college uh, contingent and really their leadership in, in really compiling a great list of resources and, and materials for everybody. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Take care. Appreciate it.